Okay, so in the beginning of our chapter, we talked about bond polarity. We talked about what had to happen in order for something to be considered a polar covalent bond. Are we, is that ringing bells? Yeah. Okay, a polar covalent bond. Remind me, in a polar covalent bond, are electrons shared evenly or unevenly? They are shared unevenly. In a polar bond, electrons are shared unevenly. When they become shared unevenly enough, it breaks apart and becomes an ionic bond, right? So we go from covalent, which means nice sharing, right? Nonpolar covalent means nice sharing. Polar covalent means sharing, but still I get more and you get less type thing. And then when it comes so uneven, that becomes an ionic bond, right? I'm just going to take the electron from you. Okay, so a polar bond is when electrons are shared unevenly between the two atoms. That's what is considered a polar covalent bond. Yes. Oh, We're going to switch focus not to bond polarity, but now molecular polarity. So when is a molecule considered polar, right? When is a whole compound considered polar? Okay, that's kind of the question that we're looking at today. A molecule is considered polar when it has what is called a dipole moment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over what that means here in just a second, what it means to have a dipole moment. But you can write that down, and then I'll talk through some main points of that. Okay, a dipole moment. I would maybe highlight that or circle it or something because that's important. A dipole moment is important. So I want to talk a little bit about what it means to, what the word dipole means. What does it mean to have a pole? You know, think about, okay, let's think about a magnet. You know, the ends of magnets are called poles. So what does the prefix di mean? How many? Two. Two. So a dipole means that this molecule doesn't have a charge. It has two charges, right? It has it has one end that is different than another end. Okay, so dipole means that we have two poles on this molecule. Okay, so I'm going to break that down a little bit further even, okay? Um, when we share electrons unevenly throughout the whole molecule, it will, it will make one end of the molecule positive and one end of the molecule negative, or one section of the molecule positive and one section of the molecule negative, right? It's going to have this different um, distribution of the electrons within the whole molecule, okay? And so when that happens, we can consider it polar, okay? And the positive end of one molecule will attract to the negative end of another molecule, and you'll see them start to bond in that way, okay? But a big clue for us to know if a molecule is polar or not is if the molecule is asymmetrical. And I don't mean like two-dimensional asymmetrical. I mean like when you look at it in three dimensions, does it all look the same, right? A tetrahedral molecule is symmetrical, but a trigonal pyramid molecule is not because trigonal pyramid molecules have a lone pair on top, not another molecule. So we're going to start looking at how, what are clues for us to know if a molecule is polar or not. But asymmetry is a big, big indicator of polarity, okay? So we're going to look at the molecule HCl. Okay, it's a very simple molecule. If I want the Lewis structure for HCl, I need to have eight electrons. Okay, because chlorine gives us seven, hydrogen gives us one. If we only have two atoms, do we really have a central molecule here, right? It can't be hydrogen, but there's only two things. So we're just put them next to each other, right? H and Cl. I will bond. And then do I put lone pairs around, around hydrogen? Now, I just put my lone pairs around chlorine, okay? So there's four, six, and eight electrons. We've used all our electrons. That's what the molecule looks like, okay? So now, in this molecule, there only happens to be one bond. But we can look at polarity in molecules that have lots of bonds, okay? I just want to start with a simple one. So get out your Pauling scale and your molecular geometry sheet and tell me which one of those atoms is more electronegative than other, than the other. Which one's more electronegative? Chlorine. Okay, chlorine is more electronegative, which means the electrons in this bond, the one from hydrogen and the one from chlorine, instead of being dispersed evenly like that, can you see the molecule I'm drawing with the electrons? Can you see that? Okay, instead of them being evenly dispersed, chlorine is pulling on the electrons more. So instead of them being evenly dispersed, they might sit right there, 
in the bond, right? It's, it's like a tug of war. It's pulling hydrogen's electron closer to itself because it wants it more than the other, right? It wants to complete that octet more than hydrogen cares to, okay? So when this happens, chlorine doesn't get a full negative charge by having an extra electron. It takes on what's called a partial negative charge, okay? This little symbol right here is called a partial. It's a Greek letter, but you draw it kind of like an Kind of like an S, kind of like a D, right? It means, um, it just means a partial, okay? So that means chlorine hasn't fully taken the electron from hydrogen. It doesn't have a full negative charge. It's like a pseudo charge, right? It's like a, an almost charge, a wannabe charge, okay? And so if chlorine has a partial negative charge, what does that mean has to be true for hydrogen? Partial. It's going to have a partial... Positive. positive, right? Because it hasn't lost its electron totally, but it's become pretty close, right? The electron scooted away from hydrogen and went towards chlorine. And so we have what's called a partial positive and partial negative on that molecule. Okay, what questions do we have about that part so far? So the last thing I want to show you here is this dipole moment, right? We represent the dipole moment with an arrow, okay? And we represent it in, in the direction of the electrons, Okay, so when I draw the dipole moment, I might say, if the molecule is polar, draw the dipole moment. And so the dipole moment would look like this. We point the arrow toward the electrons, right? Where, if it's an uneven distribution of electrons, then where are those electrons at, right? Where are the electrons? And so I draw my dipole moment in an arrow toward those electrons or toward that partial negative. Okay, so if you want to remember with dipole moment, we put a plus side on the partial positive side, and we take our arrow toward that negative. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, it's simple for a molecule that only has two atoms. We're going to start looking at molecules that have more than those. All right, but what questions do we have? All right, so that arrow is called what? The dipole, the dipole moment, right? So when I say indicate the dipole moment, you're going to tell me, you're going to draw it with an arrow, and usually it goes toward the electrons. Yep. We know how to draw the Lewis structure for water, and I want you to now start drawing it in a basic three-dimensional shape because that helps us identify polarity, okay? It helps us identify polarity because when I draw water, if I draw it like this, like we did when we were first learning, that doesn't really show us the true shape of the molecule, right? It doesn't show us an uneven distribution of electrons. Right now, everything looks even, correct? But when we, when, we, when we have that water molecule in three dimensions, right, in real life, it doesn't look like that. It's bent, right? We've got hydrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen with a lone pair. Okay, sorry. These are lone pairs, not oxygens. Okay, so now we see, although it looks symmetrical in two dimensions, we know that in three dimensions, we've got these electrons up on top. Do we agree? So we said asymmetry is a big indicator of polarity, and that's true. But I want to go even a step further and say not just asymmetry, but a lone pairs on the central atom are a really good indicator of polarity. Okay, so maybe make an extra little note. Okay, if it has lone pairs on the central atom, it's usually polar. Okay, it's not a 100% tried and true, but most of the time, right? When we've got a lone pairs on the central atom, that molecule is going to be considered polar, okay? So we've answered that part. Tell me what, we already said its molecular geometry is bent. Its molecular geometry is bent. It's got four domains, right? One, two, three, four, and how many of those are lone pairs? Two. Two. So do we see bent on our sheet? I might have to flip it back over, but it's bent. Now I want you to tell me, is the molecule polar or nonpolar? I think it's polar, right? So how do we determine that? Okay, lone pairs on the central atom, that's a big clue. But now let's go even a little bit deeper here. Let's look at the individual bonds. Let's look at the bonds within this molecule. So a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. Look on your electronegativity table. Tell me which one's more electronegative oxygen and is it greater than 0.3 yeah. difference in electronegativity right the difference between them is it greater than 0.3 yes. yes okay that means we've got a polar bond between oxygen and hydrogen okay the bond itself is polar 
Which of them is more electronegative, you said? Oxygen. Oxygen. And so the electrons in this bond, right, is this big enough that you guys can see? Okay, the electrons in the bond, instead of being spread out evenly amongst them, right, they're not distributed evenly anymore. Oxygen's hogging that electron and pulling it closer to itself. So now the electrons look like this. So oxygen takes on what? A partial, partial positive or negative? Negative, right? It's pulling that electron closer to itself. Now, is there any way the other hydrogen-oxygen bond would be different? Right? It's still the same two atoms. So the oxygen-hydrogen bond on the other side would be the same. So this oxygen takes on another partial negative, and hydrogen takes on a partial positive, partial positive. Okay? Because the, the electrons in this bond are also being scooted toward oxygen. What questions do we have about that? Yeah. Oh. So with every single polar bond on each side gets the partial positive and positive. That's right. Right. If there's a polar bond, there's going to be a partial uh, assigned to it. Now, I'm not going to say that you guys always have to draw the partial positives, partial negatives. You don't have to do that. But it just gives us me an idea about which side the molecule is negative and which side is positive. Uh -huh. Do we draw the dipole moment if it's like a molecular geometry? Bingo. Okay, we're going to draw the dipole moment next. So now we've got to figure out what's the overall dipole moment of the molecule, right? Because you can draw dipole moments of individual bonds, like mini ones, right? Towards oxygen, towards oxygen. But where do we see the overall electrons are located at? Oxygen. Top of the molecule, bottom of the molecule, left, right. Where do we think? Top, right? So my dipole moment goes toward the electrons, just like that. This big red arrow is going to be my dipole moment. Okay, I know I've got lots of diagrams happening on here, but that would be my dipole moment right there. Because the top of the molecule clearly has a greater um, distribution of electrons than the bottom. Okay, or the oxygen side of that molecule clearly has a greater distribution of electrons. So it's giving me that partial negative. Plus, we've got two partial negatives up here on oxygen. Okay, so dipole moment, you can draw them on the bonds if you want. That maybe gives you a clue as to where your overall dipole moment is, but you don't have to draw them necessarily, right? You could just look at the, look at the, I can't know what I'm saying. Look at the Lewis structure and say, oh, here's a bunch of electrons up on top, right? There's my dipole moment. That works too. Okay, but I want you to understand the, the parts, the moving parts behind that. Okay, very good. Da, 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 da. All right, the next couple little points here on our slides, we already answered all those. So we decided that water is polar. We decided that water is polar. I want to watch a little video here that helps us differentiate some more things between polar and non-polar here. So I'm not going to watch the whole thing, but I've got a couple parts of it that I want to watch. Sorry, give me a second. All right. By this point, I feel like we should be pretty good with Lewis structures. We agree? Yeah. Feel pretty comfortable with drawing them. Okay. So I'm not going to talk through that part. Oh, no. What's the shape? Tell me what's the geometry. Trigonal pyramid. Now we've got to determine, is the molecule polar or nonpolar? Is there a region of the molecule that is more electronegative than another? Yes. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Do we need to break it down by the individual bonds? Right? Do we need to identify if the bonds are polar themselves or not? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because the, the base of this molecule, if I look at it in three dimensions, the base of this molecule is symmetrical. Right? It's got three things spread out um, in the base of it's symmetrical. But we've got this lone pair that's throwing things into a, a kind of a wrench. Right? There's some, the lone pairs are making that change. And so if I draw my dipole moment... Um, with molecules drawn in two dimensions like this, it doesn't really matter what direction it comes from. 
we're going to draw our, our dipole moment in the direction of the lone pair, right? When I think about it in three dimensions, the, the um, dipole moment goes toward the top of the molecule, right? Because that's where the lone pair is. So when I draw it in two dimensions, I, I don't have to draw it from any particular direction, right? It just needs to go toward the lone pairs. Can we visualize that in 3D? Right? Look at your molecular geometry handout and look at that trigonal pyramid molecule. It's got a, this triangle base on the bottom. Its central atom is lifted a bit, and then it's got the lone pair up on top. And so that's where our dipole moment is really pointing, is toward that lone pair, right? Where are there more electrons in the molecule than they're not, okay? And so that lone pair tells us right there. So this is polar. You will also start to see um, trends with the shapes of molecules, right? All trigonal pyramid molecules are polar. Right? All bent molecules are polar. I say all, but 99.8, okay, whatever percent. You'll start to see trends. Tetrahedral molecules are not polar usually, right? Usually. But you're going to start seeing some trends as we go through that. Okay? CCL4. How do we name it? Carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride. Good. It's covalent, so we need the prefixes. Okay, so carbon, and then I'd put lone pairs around every chlorine. I'm not too excited about doing that right now, but we can. When you're doing things just to identify polarity, I'm okay if you don't put your lone pairs on the outsides as long as you know where they go. Um, but now I'm going to look at polarity here. Are the individual bonds polar? Yeah, I think they are, right? Chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. So the individual bonds are polar, right? But what happens here? Do they cancel each other out? Yes, right? This is geometrical symmetry as well as electron symmetry. So this molecule would be considered non-polar. Non-polar. Because they everything cancels out, right? There's no region of the molecule that has more electrons than another. Oops, sorry. What, what's your central atom gonna be here? Is, is it gonna be hydrogen? No, gonna be carbon, okay.